All right. Welcome to the Hit Bombs podcast. We're not even sure if that's what we're going to call it. Uh, I'm joined today by my co-host, Victor Bourget, who is the man behind the scenes over at HitBombs.com. And probably the best swing on Instagram, Drew Cooper, uh, known Drew now for a couple of years. Uh, thanks for hanging out today, guys. Yeah. <clears throat> thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to kick off the podcast, Josh. Yeah. Now, Vic, what were the the other names we were thinking of for this podcast? We, we could we could have the viewers decide what this is actually going to be called because we, I got to admit, we have no clue what we're doing. We're just kind of winging this, and uh, we'll see what what comes of it. But what were those names? Yeah, we had a couple. We had. Um, let me pull them up here. We had Drive for Dough. That was one I came up with. Uh, bomb Talk from AI. Uh, AI seemed to like Bomb Talk. Uh, Josh, I don't know. Did you have another one? I'm trying to look back at the text and, and see if there's any other ones. Uh, yeah, the, the bomb the bomb talk has me a little worried. I'm I'm a little worried our YouTube account's going to get flagged for like terrorist activity or something. So, um, what do you think, Drew? Yeah, it's tough. He hitting knowledge bombs, sending knowledge bombs. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. uh, so Drew, let's let's uh, let's talk a little bit about yourself. So so we met years ago, probably what five or six years ago now. Yeah, it's been a while now. Through the uh, through the COVID Dana Dahlquist coaches thing you guys were running. Yeah. So what were you doing at the time when uh, when you joined Dana's program? So at the time, I was I had, I had literally like just had twins. So like they might have I don't even know if they were home yet. So they were in the NICU for a couple of weeks. So it was either like right as they got home or sort of in that time. COVID was like just hitting. Um, the place I was working with COVID hitting, uh, we were functioning in a lot of pro sports and all of the pro sport teams had shut down their finances. So like everything was on freeze. So they weren't paying any bills. Um, so the company I worked for basically put everybody on part-time work. And I was sort of like, what, what am I going to do? I literally just had kids and you just cut my salary in half. And so I was looking at things I used to love and um, started looking at golf kind of more seriously. So like I had done strength and conditioning work for golf. Um, when I was in high school, I coached and worked at a Nike golf camp in Monterey. So like I had this desire to sort of get back into golf. I was just picking up my clubs again after quitting for, God, like a decade. Um, and so it was like this steamroll of things that just pushed me into doing something I was sort of passionate about again, instead of just kind of like doing things because I had an education in it. And because I was like rolling down the hill, if you want to like of progress in a, in a career. So that's where I was. I was sort of like in this spot of like, what the hell am I going to do? Like, how am I going to make money? Um, and I had that urge to kind of work for myself again. I didn't want to work for people who could make that decision that like, Hey, like we're doing this to your salary. Like I, I wanted to be in more control of my life. Now, if I remember correctly, you were actually working for a, a force plate company, correct? Yeah. So it was a, it was actually, so I worked for a dual force plate company that got bought by a larger sport technology company, um, that did like simple motion capture, dual force plates, hamstring testing, groin testing. Um, and the whole goal of that company was to be like a biomechanics lab, in a, in a truck that was affordable. So like, you know, me as an individual guy with a gym could buy their equipment rather than spending, you know, triaxial force plates are like 40 grand to get your hands on software and plates. Uh, these ones were, I think you could get them for like 10, eight. Um, you could get a pair that I actually still have. You can get those for 2,500 bucks. So like they ran software and hardware that was very cheap and very user friendly. So we were working um, in every major sport you, you can imagine, all the Olympic training centers, National Institutes of Sport, like you're talking rugby, women's soccer, cricket, NFL, MLB, NBA, NCAA, military groups, Navy SEALs. Um, so like we, I, we were all over the place. It's a, it's a huge company in the sport technology world at this point. Yeah, so, so and also you're, you're doing some work now with Swing Catalyst as well, which is one of the major golf force plate manufacturers. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But through, through Dana's program, you ended up picking up a lot of speed. And I thought you were 
a very fitting guest to, to come on to the first podcast for multiple reasons. One, you're a bomber. Um, but two, um, you know, we've had some really cool discussions around equipment, especially of recent. But as far as uh, that speed gain, what would you sort of attribute that to? Uh, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me was like a like a reorganization of how I saw a golf swing. So like my whole life, like I was one of the longer hitters. You know, I wasn't like the longest guy ever. Plenty of people hit it as far or further. But like I was always taught to kind of calm down on the golf course, like don't move as much, um, you know, kind of get up to the top of your backswing, stop and then have a downswing. So like a, a bunch of that type of thought process is how I sort of approached my golf was like, don't try and hit it so hard. Um, make sure you have some time between backswing and downswing, uh, swing short, kind of like a bunch of older, I guess, information. And so like right away with Dana, first the first thing was like this discussion of starting the downswing before the backswing was over type deal. And that that whole concept, it was just like it was like immediate, like these little like ledges I would climb um, where ball speed would pick up, club speed would pick up. Things felt easier. Um, And then with that kind of had fun with the Instagram page, uh, getting back in the gym. So we had I think we were building our house or renovating our house. And so once I got the gym back, it was like I was I was seeing Dana. I was in the program. And then I was training again. So it was like those those things, like reshaping how I saw a golf swing and then getting back to being a bit stronger were the two big things. And obviously, you're, you're a good athlete, right? I mean, based off how fast you can move a club head, it, it shows that you're a great athlete. And, um, you know, I think for me growing up, golf was taught very mechanical, very position oriented, which is great. I think it's, yeah. it's always great to have some level of structure. Um, but some of the stuff that me and Dana have talked about over the years is more along the lines of the dynamics, right? And how to generate force. So did some of that free you up and allow you to be more of an athlete? hundred percent, hundred percent. And I think like you, you hit the nail on the head though. Like I had a lot of good, like golf swing structure. Like I had a, a pretty looking golf swing when I met you guys, but like I, I sort of achieved that by like slowing down and like carefully maneuvering my way through the swing. So like that whole freedom thing of being like, no, you can swing it back with some speed. You can move. But like when you move, you have to counter that with like force production sooner than you have been doing. Um, So stuff like that really started to feel like I was doing anything, throwing a baseball, throwing a football. Um, It just started to become a lot more like open, like a lot more um, athletic than it did I don't know. I don't like structured. Like it used to feel like very mechanical and like cautious. Now it doesn't feel cautious at all. A lot of people think like when they're going to gain a bunch of speed, I'm going to start spraying it everywhere and and not hit it straight whatsoever. So I'm just curious to kind of hear what your experience was after that speed jump. And did you hit it straighter? Did you hit it more crooked? What did that look like? No, it's a good question because I like the way I explain it is I hit the ball like So let's say I met Dana, like I actually have track man data at around 124 miles an hour with a driver. And I remember text messaging my friends being like, this is it. Like, this is all I have me trying to swing out of my shoes. Um, And from 124 to about 140 miles an hour on track, man, everything just got better. Like ball flights were better. Accuracy was better. And then I sort of like clipped this point around, let's say 145 ish miles an hour on track, man where then we started to like curve over the bell curve and back down into like, it was really good and then kind of like not so good. So it was like this, there was like a tipping point where it was like, like if I had just stopped at 140, I'd be a much better golfer. But I was like, I'm, I'm doing this to swing as fast as I can. So some of the accuracy and consistency stuff goes out the window. Cool, good deal. Uh, Drew, then another question, uh, kind of relating to that you mentioned going from i think one 122 to 145 so just kind of curious to hear like what did the speed progression look like was it just every day it's a mile an hour or was it like sometimes nothing 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 and then like a little leap five miles an hour or how did that look like yeah it's a good question um so like at the beginning like it was kind of like clumps i would say so like the 124 
I want to say the first almost like seven to eight miles an hour. So like clipping 130, like I would say relatively easily with a s- standard driver that happened in like two weeks. That was like, just kind of like clicked like the, you know, getting left sooner, separating kind of that, that little spark was just like seven miles an hour club speed, sort of like felt like overnight. Um, then it was sort of like this kind of like slow, slow build. It would be like, I was training pretty hard. I was using force plates. And so I, I have some background, like Josh said in that I was tracking a thing called uh, reactive strength index modified. A lot of speed power sports use it. It's, it's how high you jump divided by how long it takes you to jump. So it's like this neuromuscular quality. Um, when that was down, so like, let's say I jump 10 inches and I do it in a half a second. If I jump 10 inches, but it took me 0.6 seconds, like my club speed was down. So like if I trained hard and the neural muscular system was in the tank, I'd never expected good, good swing speeds. Um, when I recovered and I started seeing good trends in the force plate data, just jumping, like nothing to do with golf, uh, I would see good trends in the the club speed stuff. So like the initial technical stuff was just like seven, eight miles an hour, literally felt like overnight. Then it was just some, some training stuff that was like, it might be two miles an hour this month, maybe a couple miles an hour the next week, then maybe another month until I got a mile an hour. So it was sort of like this ebb and flow type deal. Um, And the vast majority of that is with a 46 inch driver. Like I, I never really, did much work with a 48 inch driver. I never really liked it. Um, and I never really felt comfortable hitting it into my little net with a bunch of really expensive homes behind it. So that's all, yeah, pretty much 40, 46 inches, um, leading up into that first long drive event. Now the, the thing about all this great speed is, is it starts to change how you play on the golf course. And this is where some of our conversations have led of recent, uh, it, it's hard to build a bag that supports that kind of club head speed. You know, when you look at a lot of the, the equipment on the market, it's not designed for guys 135, 145 miles an hour with a driver. So um, for me, the big thing was the trajectory. I My ball would balloon, especially when playing. So any wind, there, there was no chance I was going to play good. Did you have something, some similar issues with that? 100%. And I... Uh... I don't know what you are on a golf course swinging like a seven iron. So like when I was on a, when I was doing this more heavily and I'll start to do it again, my seven iron on a track, man, just like cruising around playing golf was around 110 miles an hour. And so like, that's, that's not typical for your average golfer. It's not even typical for your fast tour player. So like I found that like I could build a set that was like good somewhere, like maybe the long irons were good. But then the short irons were like freaking missiles. And then I would build a set where the short irons were good, but then the long irons were like unbelievably high spin. And I would have this problem where I had good gapping at one end of the bag and then really bad gapping somewhere else. So I would struggle with like the the last set of artisans were, were so good from lob wedge to about seven iron. And then the six, five, four, three, all just like compressed in yardage because they would just spin more and float more. And so I would have this problem between three iron and whatever I hit next, which was for me a mini driver or a two iron or something. Um, That gap was enormous. Like it was, I'm either like ripping mini driver 320 through the air or I'm dropping back to a three iron that's like 260, 250. And so I had this massive gap where I was like, okay, what do I do here? if I'm one at T club, that's like 280, like I, I've got nothing. So I'm, I'm flirting with these issues or like you said, in the wind, the wind was a joke, like downwind, I'd hit a seven iron from 230 into the wind. I'd hit it from like 170, 180. Yeah. So it was like this real mind game trying to play golf. Yeah. For me, if I was going to play somewhat decent, it would feel like I'm swinging 60, 65%, yeah. you know, to, to get it on the golf course, which I hated. Because uh, it was actually harder for me to sequence the the swing that way. Now I know at some point you talked to Bryson, and he said, 
instead of swinging easier, bend your clubs five degrees stronger and rip it as hard as you can. And you said the light bulb went off. Tell me about that. Yeah, it was it was funny. So it was like a it was an Instagram story and I, somebody had asked about the loft jacking stuff. And I was like, I don't know, man, I watched Bryson do it and he seems to play really good golf. So like he's the only person that I can relate to from a swing speed standpoint who plays golf at like, you know, a level I could only dream of playing. And so it makes you curious. Like I said, for a long time, he's the only person on tour I watch who, who makes me interested in what equipment they're playing and why. Um, nobody else like Cam Champ should, but he hits he hits it so low that it's like I watched him in person. It's not relatable. Um, so I said this thing. I was like, you know, I don't know what works. I've always played pretty standard clubs, but I've watched Bryce and blah, blah. And he sent me a message and he was like, all that matters is like, what was it? Uh, spin rate, descent angle and yardage. He was like, if the ball stops, it, it flies the right distance and you gap. He's like, forget it. Like, just get a golf club that you can swing normally and it does what you want it to do. Like, basically forget about everything else. Nothing else matters. And I was kind of like, okay, that makes sense. But like the, the part of me that gets scared is like, if I do that, I'm going to hit a pitching wedge, like 180. Like, how do you like, how do you have three clubs from 180 down? So that was the part where I couldn't figure it out. Like that's, and that's where like, you know, Bryson being Bryson gets to try iteration of iteration of iteration of a golf club. Whereas me and you, like, they're kind of like, here's a pitching wedge, <laughs> you know, good luck. Yeah. And I'm sure, I'm sure if you worked with, you know, some of the leading manufacturers super closely. And like you said, if you had access to th different equipment and did hours of testing, I'm sure you could come up with something. But um, this is where the Avoda Golf has really sparked my interest. And um, we both got connected to them through different avenues. Um, but I would say my, my interest started around the Masters, right? As you said, anything Bryson does, yeah. I'm like, okay, like we're similar club at speed. And the first thing that caught my eye was his irons actually had some bulge on them, which is one of the things or one of the reasons why he switched to the crank driver is because the crank driver has more bulge and roll. And what he figured out is the faster you swing it, you need to have more curve on the club face to help offset the gear effect. And so when I saw this with the irons and then I saw they were doing one length stuff and a multiple length iron, I, I was super intrigued. So, so talk about um, kind of what, what sparked your interest with them. So, I mean, the same exact thing sparked my interest. It's like, how can you, like you said, watch a guy who swings it. I mean, for the most part, the same speed we swing it. Like, I mean, if he wants to, he can be as fast or faster than me. So how can I, how can I watch that and not go like, that's really interesting. He's playing some like unbelievable golf, hitting great iron shots. They're holding championship greens. Like that's not an issue. He's hitting shots that are, you know, three quarter shots, full shots. Um, it's not like he's like a complete one trick pony out there just smashing irons. And so I was like, okay, like that's super interesting. Um, hearing that they had bulge was very interesting, but that wasn't the thing for me. It was like, watching his tracers when he was playing and they were just like they were just like these flat well hit far traveling golf balls and i was like that doesn't look like me playing golf like i'd be hitting an extra club and the ball would be twice as high yeah and i'd be hoping that it got there so like the flight that they showed and like the the shot variability like a chippy one a full one maybe a smashed one and it like they all turned out pretty well that's when i was like this is this is definitely very interesting because I've never been able to play golf like that. Yeah, Vic, do you remember? Uh, actually, so me and Vic just went for a fitting in Chicago a couple weeks ago. Vic, what did I say the first ball I hit with Bryson's iron? I don't know the exact quote, but you were uh, you were pretty fired up. I don't think you've been that excited even hitting a driver before. <laughs> yeah, I was like, holy crap. The first time I hit it, the ball flight was super penetrating. And I was like, yeah, I could actually play golf with this. And um, obviously, it's important to note that Avoda, their normal irons don't have curve on the club face. In all actuality, that only benefits a certain demographic of player. They need to have a lot of club head speed. Um, and 
I started off with the one lane set, and for me, the one lane set felt a little weird. The thing that that felt weird was having the wedges so long. I, I could do with the the longer the shorter long irons, but the the wedges just just felt too extreme. What did you, what were your first thoughts with the one length? Yeah. Yeah. So the one length, like it took me a second to put a four iron down there and have it feel like a, like an eight iron, like, and to see like no loft, like that was, it was a mind game. But like, like you said, like really quickly, that was fine. Like when you see a ball come off and it flies, like it was the first time, like you probably felt the same way where you hit a ball and you looked up and you're like, that looks like a ball that I see on a PGA tour range. Like it's not this floaty, um, thing. It's like, it's just going down range. Um, so like I got over that, but like you, the, uh, the long, long wedges, they felt fine for a full swing, but they're just difficult. And I don't know if it's just how long I've used shorter wedges and it's just something that I am accustomed to, but that was same deal. Um, the length of the wedge was the only thing that was challenging for me. Well, and that's actually what I liked about their their combo set is the the wedges were a little bit longer, but it it and which allowed me to actually have shorter long irons, which I'm used to. Because I think for me, right. um, you know, obviously when we're playing golf, and this is one of the things they said, you we we almost have to build a set that makes the ball go shorter, that that right. makes you swing it slower, helps you keep it uh, more accurate, and so having the wedges a little bit longer with the combo set long irons much shorter i just felt so much more control and back to a, a comment that you made earlier about um ha not had you know if you hit a pitching wedge 180 there's nothing to really fill that gap you know below that um the thing i love about what they're doing from a weighting standpoint is the wedges are actually a lot lighter so by having lighter wedges you're decreasing the smash essentially the ball's not going to go as far. Have you had any experience with that? Yeah. So that was what I was going to say. Like the, the thing that like peaked or that like, I, I don't know what to say peaked my interest. It like sold me was like the thought process behind like both sides of the coin. I think a lot of, a lot of people, myself included was like loft. That's it. That's like all you have to change to change the distance of all travels shaft length. But like, I never would have wrapped my head around head weights being like a contributing factor to how far a ball goes, number one. And number two, I wouldn't know a single company that would say, you know, here's a pitching wedge that's 20 grams lighter than we would normally make a pitching wedge to kill some distance. Like I, I've never come across that. Um, and going to a guy, so I have a good friend now in Norway, Oslo, Norway, Tom Horley who was a, a Nike golf master fitter back in the day, knows Mike Taylor well. And he, he kind of hit on this thing that like people don't appreciate every component of a golf club in like the performance of a club. They always look at it like it's loft. Oh, it's length. It's, it's, it's everything. And so like that was the thing when I talked to Tom Bailey was like, he was like, everything matters for you guys. Like, total weight, swing weight, head weight, shaft flex, shaft length. And he's like, all of these are variables you get to play with. Whereas with most companies, you're really only playing with loft and length. And that's, that's all you've got. So I thought that was, that was super cool. Um, especially like the, like the 50 degree wedge, like that's a much lighter head. And I see the ball like much more tame with that 50, 55, um, 60, which is really cool. Now, did you, did you go through a formal fitting with them? Yeah. So I went out to Fresno, um, and we went through the whole thing, which like I would recommend because they like, I didn't think anyone would get me out of the L series shaft. I didn't think that was ever, I love that shaft. Um, and he was just like, it may not feel the best to you, but the Bryson shaft is performing better. And he showed me some, uh, flight scope shaft acceleration profiles. And he was, I was like, I can't, I can't argue with you. Like they're way more consistent for me. Um, but if you, if I went to a normal fitting, I would, I would pick the L series every time. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, seeing them in person was fantastic. Really good. And that's, that's the LA golf shaft, correct? That's the wedge, the wedge flex yep. that Bryson hits. Yep. So I've got that, uh, Bryson wedge shaft 
lob wedge to seven iron or eight iron and then maybe seven up is the iron shaft yeah the thing that was kind of interesting about the fitting is they start by fitting lie so um immediately yeah. they they attack the lie first i ended up in four degrees upright which effectively makes the club play a lot longer one of the other reasons um i, w- I was able to go to shorter clubs um Vic, you were you were upright as well, correct? Two degrees, I think. Yeah, I think it ended up at the three degrees. Three degrees. Where? Where? where did, did he do the same thing yeah. with you, Drew? Start with lie angle. Yeah, and so I ended I ended up uh, three degrees upright, but a half inch longer than their standard. Yeah. So ultimately, the setup of a Voda for me is going to open up one additional club in the bag, right? Cause I'm not going to need as many clubs in the bag now, which I think, uh, at first I was a little bit worried about, but through some of our conversations, I'm, I'm actually getting, uh, pretty excited about one thing to note, a Voda does make a 14 degree, a 10 degree and a six degree driving iron, which I'm super excited to test out. Uh, I know you haven't tested them yet, but you do currently have a 12 degree hybrid from Callaway, that w- yeah. was Min Woo Lee's or who, whose was it? I, I don't know whose it was. I'm only guessing Min Woo because it, it had a Ventus 7 TX black shaft. And I, I think that's what he uses. Um, but yeah, that thing's a, an absolute weapon. Um, it's, a, it's a great golf club for me. How far, how far really do you well. hit that? Uh, it depends. So like, that's the cool thing is I can, I can carry it flat out three three oh five but then like i can hit like a really high cut that carries about 270 um and then i can hit it i when i was in oslo i was launching it at what was it two and a half or three degrees just like a low bullet that's like carrying 250 or so 240 and then rolling 100 yards how how long are you playing it at 41 inches yeah yep okay yeah and and that's the thing like (laughs) I guess and that's one of the big advantages of actually having the speed is is that we could take driver out of the bag, uh, you know, and allow us to hit a l- longer iron or hybrid in your case around the course. You're more likely to hit that in play. Um, and then obviously, if you get on an open hole, uh, you could bring out the big stick. But on that note, we've been having a, a, a conversation about the idea of putting two drivers in the bag. And I think there's a couple different ways you could do this. You could have one that's you know, 42, 43 inches, almost playing it like a mini driver. And then you can have one at say 45 inches or another idea that I've been thinking about is having uh, two drivers built the same way, one on a fade setting, one on a draw setting to suit the the desired shot shape. I know Phil won, I think he won the masters one year actually with, with a similar setup. Uh, so call, talk about that, you know, cause when you start to look at the idea of these mini drivers out there, Yes, they're shorter, the heads are smaller, but by having a head smaller, it actually kind of makes it harder to hit than just taking a shorter driver. Yeah, so it's it's another great spot. Like, I mean, you could could talk about it so many ways. So Marty Jurtson had a tweet and he said something to the effect of like, for any player that carries a driver over 300 yards or carries it over 310, I can't remember, he was like, absolutely consider putting in two drivers. And his was like your first point, have a bomber that's like 45, 45 and a half, low lofted, low spin, and then have like a mini driver that's, you know, 43 inches, more loft. Maybe it's a draw bias club as well. Um, but play like the, if, if we're using Ping or if we're using TaylorMade, like the LS model in the bomber and the Max version in the short club, like have a super forgiving, unbelievably forgiving mini driver. Um, and then have a bomber. So like when you're swinging well and the course is open, I mean, you get to use your biggest weapon, which is, you know, a really long tee shot. Um, and it's funny cause I made the switch from three wood to mini driver because I was like, I never hit three wood off the ground. Like it never happens. And so now it's like this like slow progression to go like, well, I never hit mini driver off the ground. So like, why don't I just put another driver in the bag? Like if, if the goal was a second tee club that's forgiving, like now, why not just do two drivers? Um, so it's it's almost like wrapping your head around it and then slowly pushing your way down the uh, the path. So by going to a 
uh, more forgiving, shorter driver. Obviously, the spin's going to go up a little bit, correct? Yeah, definitely. And in what lo- what loft did you say? Twelve degrees, or or where where, where did you kind of think that should be at? Yeah, so if like if my if my main bomber is like five, then the the second club would be somewhere around that ten degree with with the weight back. So like basically everything that kicks the ball in the air with spin, and then still play it around like that nine and a half ten degree range. Okay, yeah, and and on that note. Um we, we have been hearing some rumblings about a, a new prototype driver floating around. I, I don't want to say too much. I don't know if I'm allowed to. Uh, but five degrees, what else, what else can we say? Uh, I mean, all I know is, uh, what can I say? Five degrees, play, like static, just straight out the bag. So like that you would think is going to be adjustable. So like theoretically you have a, a hot long drive head basically right yeah um so for guys like us that's like i mean that's like unbeatable i've been arguing with oems like i you i don't know if you can answer this like why do oems make 10 degree 9 degree and 8 degree heads that are all adjustable by like two degrees so they're all overlapping like you can make the eight degree a 10 degree like why don't they go like 10 eight and a half, seven, and like spread their skews and then adjust it from there. Um, but anyways, so it'll be like the first head that you can buy a retail that's super low loft. Um, I hear there may be rumblings of two different driver heads, possibly, um, for the possibly the reasons we're talking about, maybe. Um, sounds like they're going to be similar to some of the things that you've already talked about yeah. <laughs> for faster players. Um, but yeah, that's exciting. Again, it's, it's exciting stuff for guys like us. Cause I think forever we've basically been told like guys on tour, do something, you should just do what they do and then figure it out. Well, and, and the reality is, I mean, if you look at where the game is going, the game's getting super fast, right? You're seeing these guys come out of college, 130, 135 miles an hour. I mean, look at Jake Knapp. If, if he wanted to, he could get up to 140 miles an hour. So the reality is the, the equipment fa- manufacturers are going to have to start to adjust. They're going to have to start to be a little bit more open-minded. And honestly, that that's the value I think long drive brings to an OEM like Callaway is more or less R&D of like, hey, we got to kind of figure out what, what's good for these guys so that eventually as this changes, if it does change, obviously there's so many variables that it could affect it. Um, they're not completely blindsided. Yeah, 100%. And not only that, like my thing is like if this golf ball rollback is like, a, you know, just like a slight reduction in ball speed, essentially, like a, a guy like Bryson, who's got speed in the tank, can theoretically just go swing faster and gain that speed distance back. Um, if the ball rollback happens and it, and it only happens like that. So, I, you know, I don't know what'll happen. I don't know if the spin's going to increase and more speed would be detrimental. Um, but theoretically, like if you told me your golf ball is going to go 10 yards shorter, I would just swing faster. Like I'd get that 10 back today because I just don't swing hard right now. So like the incentive to swing faster will just be more, more, uh, necessary um yeah or or a bigger advantage so i like not only will the oems have to deal with that if the golf balls get firmer or if something changes to compression they're gonna have to deal with durability yeah the reality is going to a different ball only hurts the slower player as you mentioned guys like bryson or jake knapp they have that tank they have that speed on on reserve um, and I always thought it was comical, you know, the idea of trying to shorten a driver shaft. The reality is <laughs> you hit a 48 inch shaft in competition. That thing's going to be very hard to control. If if someone can maneuver their way around Augusta hitting a 48 inch shaft, in my opinion, they should win. Hot take. But um, yeah, I, I think that, like I said, with where this game is going, it's going to be interesting to see how these OEMs react to it. Now, Drew, you mentioned uh, you were just in Norway. I think I saw a video of you playing at midnight or 1 a.m. How was that? Yeah, that's incredible. Like the the whole Norway in the summer thing is unbelievable. Like it seems like it's a it seems like sunset starts around like 
6 p.m. and then ends at like midnight. Like it's like a six hour long sunset, you know, where the sky is kind of like a different color. Um, golf in Norway is great. Like it's, it's affordable. Um, it's fun. And like I said, you could play, you could probably theoretically play anytime once you're say Trondheim and North. So kind of Oslo's Southern, uh, Norway, and then you kind of work your way up to Lofoten, which is in the, uh, when I was there in June, like you'll watch the sun go down to set and then you'll watch it turn around and come back up. So like the sun legitimately never goes away. So like it's, it's daylight 24 hours. So like that would be a trip. Lofoten would be, um, a hell of a course to play, but yeah, can't say enough good things about Toronto. Were you there um, with uh, swing catalyst? Yeah, so their their headquarters is right there in Trondheim, Norway. When we get together there, it's typically like a a, a scattered uh, schedule. So like there is obviously just some like team building, meeting people because Swing Catalyst is kind of hiring more and more people. Um, there's some educational stuff because Dr. Lin will go and he'll kind of like we'll do for the new hires, for people who work in marketing, um, show them how the plates work, how people give lessons. Um, they'll show engineers. So like when we have engineering requests for drawing tools or lesson videos, it's sort of like, this is what we do. We would like it to be able to do X, Y, or Z. And like, you can show it all to them so they can like have a better grasp of like how people are using the software, where bottlenecks are. Um, and then there's obviously new product. So there's always, new development from a software side that we cover. There's new hardware. Um, you would have seen, I think there's an Instagram post and a YouTube post about the new lighter, smaller, cheaper, dual triaxial force plates. So it's, it's like half the cost essentially, maybe even a little less if you just do the force plates without pressure. So more stuff coming all the time. So that, that trip is kind of packed full of different things. Are they still working on the markerless 3d? Yeah, so Markerless 3D for for SwingCat still like it may be like the biggest developmental undertaking they have. So like meaning the emphasis of which they are trying to develop. Um, the biggest thing about that 3D is that if you have a SwingCat system now, the cameras you would have bought through Swing Catalyst will run the 3D Markerless. So like you don't have to go get new equipment if you don't want to. I think we're going to ing- um, integrate higher end cameras. So like it'll get better, but you can run it just with whatever you've got. Um, I think it's a minimum camera requirement of two and then it gets better if you add a third and it gets better if you if you add a fourth. So four cameras, four different fields of view, um, trying to get away from as many occlusions. So like losing a shoulder behind a body segment, if you can see it from overhead, you're just trying to see as much of the body at all times as possible. Yeah, I think that markerless 3D is is where everything's going. I think if uh, you could get someone that can really dial that in and, and get really good data from it, obviously that, that beats having to wear a bunch of different sensors for data collection. Um, now, I, I know it might have been within the last year you went on a, a little bit of a weight loss journey. I think you went from 240 down to 210 maybe. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's spot on. So what was the, uh, what was kind of the goals around it? Um, you know, I, I've seen you in person, you're a big dude, but what was, what was kind of the goals around it? And did you notice any change in your club head speed losing all that weight? Um, so like the goals were not like necessarily golf related. They were just personal. Like I always joke that like Instagram knows me as the guy that was 240, but like my whole life, I was like a taller, slender person. Like I surfed growing up in, in San Diego, um, the vast majority of my life, you would like, when I was competing in powerlifting, the guys would call me that volleyball guy because I was like way taller and way thinner than everyone competing. Um, So having the kids, I had just gotten to a point where I was just sort of pissed off that I was that heavy. Um, Now moving forward, being leaner sets the stage for better like training and nutritional adaptations from like an energetic standpoint. So like the food you eat, if you train and you're leaner, does a better job going to the places you want it to muscle. Um, you have better uptake of stuff. So like theoretically, like technically long-term, it should benefit the speed stuff. Um, it should help me as I get older. Like it'll help with the wear and tear on joints. Um, 
it'll just be a better lifestyle, better health, you know, easier on your heart, easier on your organs to just be lighter. But, but predominantly that's just, I was just sick of being fat. Um, I was just really tired of it. Uh, club head speed didn't change at all. Yeah. Just same. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of at that point now too. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm 34. How old are you? 38, 39? Yeah. 38. 38. So, and, and I, I've been walking around about 235 for a couple of years, but I, I've been this last year, my knees have just been hurting and that's kind of watching your journey. That was the one thought that came to mind is if I get a little bit of weight off, um, you know, is it just going to be easier on my joints moving forward? Obviously the thing with me is, um, I've been comfortable with this weight. So there's always a fear of like, all right, how will I swing a club if I do lose some weight? But, uh, what was, what was that process? How did you go about losing the weight? I saw you spend a lot of time on the elliptical. Yeah. So like, it's a good point. So there's two main things. One, I just upped my, uh, output. So I would do and like the ellipticals I would do for like 40 minutes to an hour at a time but it's super low, like very low intensity, um, heart rate. It's called cardiac output work. So it's a, it's a type of aerobic activity that's continuous at a low enough heart rate to get, it's called left ventricular like expansion. So like the heart actually gets bigger chambers. So it's, it's got a lot of positive cardiorespiratory benefits and it's super, uh, like non-stressful from a competing demand. So like big weightlifting. If I did intervals, those two would compete for the same energy resources. When I do like heavy intensive jumps, squatting, and then I do like this really low intensity cardio, they kind of don't interfere with one another as long as I don't put them right next to each other. Um, so that's the reason for that. And then just better eating. So like the thing you said about the, the knees, like I have a, I have a really bad left shoulder from a car accident and then I've got some upper back stuff, same thing, car accident. The, the types of foods you eat when you're starting to get bigger t- tend to not be the best. Um, so cutting out some of the crap, I, I just always say I eat like an adult or I eat like a kid. Um, when you eat junk food, like you tend to cause some inflammation in the body and like things just don't feel good. Um, and that does go away. So lots of vegetables, lots of meat, um, rice, potatoes, bread is fine. Um, but yeah, that's basically just ate like an adult and worked so no more enrique's with uh dana in long beach yeah right <laughs> right and no more like boxes of oreos at the, at the end of the day yeah <laughs> love it um so i put out a message on instagram last week for a couple of questions for you and i saw this one a few different times but talk about your tempo does it when you're swinging, does it feel as smooth as it looks or do you, do you feel like you're actually going at it pretty hard? It's a, it's such a, like an interesting question. So it, when I'm swinging poorly, it feels like I'm trying harder. Um, the better I swing, like it doesn't feel like I'm swinging easy. Like it, there's always intent, especially like at, at a long drive event. Um, but when I'm going really fast and things feel really good, it does feel very free and supple. Like it, it doesn't feel tense. It doesn't feel effortful in like a muscular sense, but it feels very snappy and very like intent driven. So again, if you throw a baseball hard, you don't feel like muscular effort, but you feel like you're trying to throw a baseball hard. Um, it's hard to describe that. Like if you jump high, you don't like flex your quads and squeeze and like you just you just move quicker so like there's intent but it's not this really aggressive muscularly driven grinding intent if that makes sense so what do you think makes your swing look so so smooth then i mean because you are you are generating speed why do i think um i mean everyone's got their their thought process like dr lynn thinks it's the smoothness of like the force traces so like when he puts me up against i think he's got a force trace of martin borgmeyer from from a long time ago um and martin's swinging faster kyle he's got one from kyle from years ago but like their force traces are a bit more jagged like there's parts of it which are sharp and if you look at mine they're like these little like uh rainbow humps like there's there's almost no jaggedness to any of my traces. So he thinks it has to do with that. Um, my, I think there's some genetic stuff. So I think I've got good like lat tendons. 
Um, my, my older brother could throw like a 90, 90 mile an hour fastball. Um, I, I used to be able to do pull-ups with 135 pounds tied to me. So like, I think I've got good architecture in some of my pulling muscles. Um, so like when I get a nice big stretch, I think I've got some benefits there. I've got long limbs, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's mostly that like my sequence is pretty good. Um, and I decelerate the club on the way through pretty, pretty quickly. I would say like, I don't have that swing like an Adam Scott where it like comes flinging around my neck and like kind of bounces. It just kind of stops. So I think that gives the appearance as though like it was all under control. And you mentioned, you mentioned long drive. This was the other thing that I got a lot of messages on. So, uh, you have competed twice, Vic, I don't know if you know this, but Drew has actually competed twice, uh, in the PLDA era. You had a, a runner up finish to Justin James, third, if I'm not mistaken. Third, Justin. third. No, Justin beat okay. me with semis. Yeah. So he, yeah, so he was OB on every ball. Every ball, and on his sixth ball, he was on the line and beat me on the sixth ball at 400 yards. That's that's long that was drive. My first event. But um, what was it? What was it like competing? Um, how, how could? What, I'm sure you probably felt adrenaline like you've never felt before. Yeah. So it's interesting. So like the the first stages weren't as adrenaline filled as they were like this is a shit ton of swinging. Like it is a lot of swinging. It's, it's more, uh, I don't want to say rushed, but I was more rushed personally. Like I got to get all these balls hit in this amount of time. I got to make sure I'm, I've got everything. So like my brain was a bit like on edge. And then when I got in the semis with Justin, I was like jacked. Like, I think that's why I struggled to hit the ball. Like if you watch that heat, I basically snap hook like four balls OB, which I never do. Um, cause I was like, that was the first time, like I had a hard time teeing up a ball. Cause I was like, Oh man, this is Justin James. Like this guy actually won a world title. Like I'm going to get my ass kicked. Um, <laughs> so like I was, I was jacked up in that one. It's, it's funny you say that because I remember watching and sure enough, there's Drew like slowly walking to the tee box. You had your coffee in hand and I think you're the yeah. last one, last one up there. And I was like, man, he, he probably just feels very uncomfortable with the whole experience. But, uh, what was, what was the big takeaway? I know you only competed twice. What was the biggest thing you learned from that process? The takeaway from competing is a, like the biggest thing is the sheer amount of like high intense swings you have to be able to make like that unto itself sort of blew me away. Um, how tired and sore I was the next day, um, how ill prepared I was going into it from like a, like a hit count type deal. Um, that was the biggest thing. The second biggest thing was like the guys who win and win or like who are up there often, are good ball strikers. Like they hit the ball well. Like um, there's very few guys who you know their names who are not good ball strikers. Like I think people would be surprised at some of the people, how well some of the guys hit the ball. Guys like Kyle and Justin yourself. Um, like they, you hit the ball very well. So I, I think that's sort of like this weird thought that like, oh, they're, you know, guys are off balance. They're, they're just they're not very good. And you're like, I don't know, man, if you watch them hit the ball, it looks pretty damn good. Um, there's not many like topped golf balls out there. So that was a big takeaway is how good people hit the ball. I was, I was really impressed with Kyle when I saw him at one stop, um, how well he hit the ball. i never saw Martin in an event. I don't think me and you ever crossed paths in no. an event. I've only seen you hit. Yeah. Outside of events. Um, and Justin, ju like, Justin hits the ball like I think much lower than I would have thought. It's uh everyone else is sending it way up in the air. He hits like a really flat, good looking golf ball to me. Yeah, Ju Justin's very ca very calculated. I mean, he kind of he kind of will hit and has the ability to hit the shot that's needed at a at a certain time. I think that's why he's been one of the best for the last five or six years. Is he's just so versatile, um, and obviously someone that works super hard at his craft knows what he's talking about. I mean, he's he does a lot of stuff in the strength conditioning world. Um, but the viewers want to know: Will there be a return to long drive for June Cooper? 
Uh, you never know. There's, there's a thing out here in California. Um, the NorCal golf guys started. That's a round of golf followed up with a long drive event. Yes. I, that, I thought of yeah. you when I saw that. I, I was like, if Drew signs up, I'm not going. Yeah. So like that one I might do. If I can, I would do it again. I would do it again. If they get closer to me, like the, the events, they're just like the ones that are like across the country, I probably won't do. Um, but stuff that gets close, it would be fun. Drew, is there anything from your, your fitness background going into long drive that you were able to like, that helped you compete in long drive? Or is there anything in long drive where you notice something and like, hey, maybe I, long drive kind of taught me something I didn't really think about before? Yeah, so... so I got two answers. One, the, the fitness, sports science, nutrition stuff. Like I had Landon, Landon's my next year golf co-founder. Um, so he's got a master's in exercise physiology and he's a registered dietitian, sports dietitian. So like our warm up prep, um, our in competition supplement usage, uh, hydration, like he was he like dialed, like there was like time limits on when I had things. That's why I had the coffee with me. Like when I say like he's prepared, like it's pretty cool. So like he's really good at that. So I think that that prep and the like that during competition, what you eat, what supplements you take, how they interact, like the hydration status. Like that's where I like when I watch guys, it kind of looks very haphazard. It just looks like dudes are cruising around, hanging out where like I was like checking my watch and like, okay, it's time to have this much water. Okay, it's time to, you know, knock back a couple like carnitine stuff. Like there was like this like regimented thing. So come the end, <clears throat> even though it was my first time competing, I wasn't that bad. Like I, I still had, I was getting faster in my last set. Um, so that was good. And then what was the second part of that question? Well, if, you, if anything kind of surprised you from long drive and competing there that you were unprepared for, or you took away from long drive back to fitness. Yeah. Okay. So the, the ball counts, so the, the hit counts, um, and preparing for that, like I didn't even land and I joked after my second competition, um, I hurt my left thumb, like the tendon in my left thumb, which was really annoying. But essentially what we did is we underprepared and we had this like, so it's like called uh, an acute chronic workload. And so like the chronic workload, like what you do over time needs to slowly raise to meet the demands of like that acute uh, competition. And what I was doing is I was keeping everything way down here and then I was competing way up here. Then I'd go way back down and I'd, you know, do my training. I, my speed sessions were like 30 minutes. Like when I hear about what guys are doing, like my speed sessions were a joke. It was so short. And then I would go compete and I couldn't like manage it. So the treating long drive, like it's almost this combination of a hundred meter sprint meets a marathon because you need like the, the work capacity to go through, you know, 15 different hundred meter sprints. And I think that's the part, like the, the preparation stuff for that. I learned quite a bit about, um, and if I went back, I would, I would do that very differently. Yeah. I think that's where a lot of the, uh, the sports science world hears about some of the ball counts that guys are doing when they're setting PRs and it just, it doesn't add up, but, uh, we know it works, right? Because there are a bunch of guys are doing it. So, uh, but Drew, I know you got to get going. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll connect again and, and, and do this again as, uh, as the world of golf evolves, but uh, I appreciate you taking the time to come out. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. That was great. I enjoyed it. Um, definitely do it again. Thanks for joining drew. All right. Well, if you guys enjoyed that podcast, uh, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment below, uh, decide, do you want to see the name of the podcast be drive for show or what was the other one, Vic? Uh, bomb talk. Bomb talk. All right. Those are the two options. Leave a comment below. Like, subscribe. We'll see you next time.